you know, what does it mean if they, they aren't going to take the vaccine? What does it mean for our world? Oh, well, I, I think it's going to be a really, well, I think the polio story in Northern Nigeria, which is really was the tipping point that made me leave UNICEF and set up the confidence project. When I saw that just, just a rumor got so out of control and had no adverse event, there was no problem with the vaccine, it was totally politically driven, and it led to Nigerian virus reinfecting over 20 countries around the world, costing the global program $500 million. That's what can happen when people don't vaccinate even in one small corner. Yeah, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Really appreciate it. No problem. It's um, yeah, it's amazing how you can spend time with people around the world without leaving your uh, <laughs> yeah. It makes it easier. Makes it easier now. Yeah. Yeah. So vaccine hesitancy. How did how did you get interested in that? Well, I kind of fell into the headlights, as they say. Uh, in a, in a way, I mean, I had been working a lot on on AIDS uh, uh, and just communicable diseases more broadly. And then I started, actually UNICEF asked me to come um, lead on the strategy and communication around the rollout of uh, new vaccines and launching Gabby. Mm -hmm. I worked uh, with Carol Bellamy for five years on that. Yeah. The idea was I was coming to work on more proactive strategies and working with countries to kind of initiate the launches of these. Um, and I ended up getting the nickname of the director of UNICEF's fire department because right. I, <laughs> there was more crisis management with people who said, well, we're not sure if we really want that vaccine. And things that UNICEF was not used to hearing that People didn't want the good things they were giving. Uh, and being the anthropologist on deck, it was like, go figure out what their problem is. Right. <laughs> what is it? You know, is it belief? Is it religion? Is it something else should, we should know about? And now, yeah. Now, you, you, does it, is it, you know, did you see that problem early on in AIDS where? people would, I mean, there wasn't a cocktail for a long time. So, so, so was it the vaccine? Is it, was it when Gavi started that you started to see it or did you see it earlier? Well, I um, just started, I mean, one of the first tasks I had was to organize the launch of Gavi. So um, it, I mean, the history of vaccine hesitancy and, and resistance is, I mean, was, this country here, I, this island I live on, um, is in the 1800s had the first vaccine, anti-vaccine, actually it was the anti-compulsory vaccine league in the 1800s. So vaccines over the years have had their issues. I mean, there is something that's not particularly natural about it, um, having a needle stuck in your arm um, or wherever, it used to be more in your bottom as a yeah. baby, but they moved that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and that's part of, um, what I see and what has fascinated me about it. I never thought I would be focused on, um, the vaccine issue for so long, but there's so many things underlying people's feelings and around vaccines that, I mean, it exposes political relations, it exposes distrust, it exposes cultural beliefs, values, politics, it's all there. Um, and it plays itself out on this theater of, of vaccination behavior. Now, did, it, yeah. was that true of smallpox too? Back, you talk about 1800s, was it, was it true all the way back then? Well, it, in different ways, I mean, it was then there was only one vaccine. I mean, one of the challenges we have now is that people are saying, whoa, enough already. You know, mothers are saying, my small baby can't take so many vaccines. Um, so we didn't have the issue of too many too soon for my child. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, it was, there was only one vaccine, but some of the themes of, I mean, really the resistance to the smallpox vaccine started much more when they put a mandate on it. And that's what revved up this libertarian theme that has been with us for, you know, 200 years plus, <laughs> you know, um, right. so there's this strong libertarian thing. There was a bit of the, it's against God's plan. It's not natural. We still see that in play out in many different ways. And then safety concerns. Um, that's another, that's probably the third domain that is stuck with us. Now, is that because we, we, uh, you know, we haven't lived around polio, so we don't, see all the people in the iron lungs everywhere so we we think that the or even now when we look at covid you know we don't we don't see a, a you know a long line of coffins going to the graveyard because it's for whatever reason it's kept out of the media is that we don't understand the risk as as uh why we should take the vaccine lately they've had a lot more of the the doom and gloom stories because they're trying to get people to stay inside because it, it's gotten pretty bad in the UK. Well, like in the US, I guess it depends where you live. Yeah. Um, but um, that's part of it, is that the, the, um, the tangible nature of the threat uh, does play a factor. And even with our uh, surveys and, and lis social listening to public conversations, um, you know, it, people's sentiments around vaccines are quite volatile. And, there was more, more willingness to take a vaccine back in June than there was in September. And then it started coming up again in the winter in terms of willingness. And it was very much coinciding with the perceived threat of the disease. It's not the only factor, but it's, it's certainly one of them. Oh, wait, I don't understand that. So, the, Sorry, could you just explain that last point? that the correlation of the hesitancy rises? Well, with back, the rise back in the, the spring, end of the spring was when people were really seeing this is big. Um, you know, I mean, already February was getting, picking up momentum, but depending on where you lived, um, people started to really get the gravity of this virus uh, late in the spring. But then in the summer, um, the, the pandemic, again, depends on where you live, but it waned a bit and people, lockdown was loosening up a bit. There was more socializing going on. And by September with polls, there was less willingness than in the, um, you know, May, June. Now, it wasn't the only reason um, because also in the meanwhile, there wasn't much information about vaccines in the beginning. It was really distancing, masking, lockdown, quarantine, you know, is it one, you know, one meter or two meters apart, masks, no masks. Um, the vaccine discussion really got going more in the summer, uh, but with the information came the misinformation. So it wasn't just about the, the level of threat, but again, when, when it started to get bad again uh, towards the winter, people's willingness for that vaccine started going up again. Um, I mean, I think some of that was boosted by the news that there was, you know, especially when the Pfizer one first announced that it was a pretty good one. I mean, much better than your typical flu vaccine. Um, there's a great piece in, I think it was the New England Journal that Danielle Offrey wrote around the H1N1 pandemic. And she called it emotional epidemiology. Mm -hmm. She talked about how, you know, in the very beginning of the H1N1 pandemic, um, her patients were like, where are the vaccines? Where are the vaccines? And then by the time they got there, it's like, no, no, thanks. I don't want that, you know? So it, it it's really, um, yeah, people are constantly, um, and, and actually it's quite sensible. I mean, they are using some level of reason there. Um, people's decisions are often portrayed as being kind of highly emotive. And there is an element of that, but they're also do bringing some reason into the decision-making. Um, you know, the decision-making process here 
it's it's um, scientists have one set of assumptions, other people have other sets of assumptions. And is the challenge here that they can't talk to one another about what's going on beyond the science? Well, that's part of it. Um, and I, I think that, but I, I do think we too often divide kind of science and fact from emotions and beliefs and because they really um, were, I, I spent a lot more time talking to um, neurologists um, uh, because we're seeing much more, I mean, the old, you know, the, the thinking part of the brain and the emotional part of the brain are very much interacting in ways that, you know, we have instincts that are actually quite, you know, they have reasons. Um, um, yeah. You know, um, do you, you know, did you see, did, did you have a feeling about this when you, you know, earlier than when you worked on Gavi? Did you, you know, did your, your father impart these, these sorts of values of talking to people and trying to get an understanding, you know, before you, you would take an action? Is that where this, this sort of oh. came from? Yeah, I mean, I think that from, well, my father was a filmmaker and a Anglican priest and pretty civil rights activist. And he was always telling, you know, encouraging us to, you know, understand that that racism and prejudice were a lot of times based on just not knowing the other side and making a lot of assumptions and that the importance of understanding the other side. And I think ultimately that's how I ended up in anthropology because it's really a, a science of listening and watching. And, um, and a lot of my work before had been more with children uh, because really in anthropology, most of anthropology was about children. It was about rituals. It was talking to parents and talking to teachers and um, not really listening to the views of children. Um, and my mentor for anthropology actually was Robert Coles who was not even Harvard, an anthropologist, right? yeah. But he he took kids, you know, out to the, you know, outside, went for a walk, sat on a bench. I mean, took them out of the clinic and put them in a comfort zone that mm -hmm. um, really, um, and listened. And, and was, when you first were in his class, was that where you started? Because he's kind of an unusual character, Robert Coles. Was he, <laughs> yeah. was he uh, amongst all those, those uh, very smart professors there, was he sort of different from the others? He was very different. I have to confess, I never formally took one of his classes. I, I had gotten a research fellowship when I graduated from Harvard uh, to, uh, and my, uh, to do a lot of research on children with differences in, in Israel. And then I was with, with different children in different contexts and my undergraduate work was with Down syndrome children being mainstreamed into a public school and very much a social ethnography. Um, and I came to him, I came back to him actually with all my photography and, and the way I was approaching this. And I said, you know, I found his work the most relevant to the way I was thinking. And I asked his advice. I had never really sat in one of his class. I had read all of his books and, um, and I said, I'm trying to decide if I go for a PhD in anthropology or go for being a documentary photographer. And he said, you are a photographer. Don't waste your time in a classroom on anthropology. So, I did you, so you went right the opposite way of what he said. <laughs> well, I kind of integrated the two because I, one of my main areas was the use of photography and anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, <laughs> I, but I did pay attention. Uh, he, he was really, uh, and he ended up actually sending his two sons to um, kind of intern with me in, in field work when I was doing my, my PhD research for them to come in and understand what kind of field work was about. It was interesting. <laughs> and that was in the Philippines? No, this was uh, in um, in 
the UK and I, my PhD research, which was a long time ago, was with the with Pakistani uh, uh, and it was a community that had a Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh children, and I was looking at how the dynamic between them. Um, yeah, it was like a pre-partition village implanted in. <laughs> yeah. Now, now when you did this. Um... You did this study, right? I guess right before COVID started, where you did uh, interviews with people all across the world about how they felt about vaccines. It, was, it seems like that was very prescient um, in terms of, you know, being able to use that research for for where we what, when COVID hit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that started. I mean, I started that. Uh, well, ten years, eleven years ago, I founded the Vaccine Confidence Project. So we had a decade of research through both through uh, media, social media monitoring, surveys, in-depth kind of local qualitative research um, around the world. We have quite a network of research collaborators really trying to get our finger on the pulse of what was driving all these different concerns. And then, and I think what um, the group that I built um, is different in the sense that a lot of there's a quite a there's a lot more than there were when I started. Um, there are more and more individual researchers doing things, but um, they're looking at a certain setting or a certain vaccine, or a, and we're really trying to get the global picture. Um, and we work collaboratively with a lot of these other researchers, but um, I think that's what uh, and we were kind of positioned for COVID, not anticipating it. In fact. My book, I was uh, handing it in basically. I mean, it was moving from the editor's desk to the production literally when they announced COVID was, you know, um, of international concern. So I, I'm glad it didn't uh, go in a month earlier because I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do the, the prologue. <laughs> nice. Oh, there's so many, you know, different factors that, that you know, you, you speak about and there's, like you, you mentioned earlier, there's the government, there's the mistrust, of not understanding science, there's religious, spiritual belief, all of those things. Have you also noted trends though in different parts of the world where perhaps people, you know, are more used to adhering to a government or, you know, they're gonna listen to what other people tell them to do. You know, here in the United States and in UK, there's such a, like you said, an independent spirit. And so people are like, don't tell me what to do. Is there a difference uh, you know, as you've been doing this project for a long time, that you can make any kind of generalization that maybe some cultures are better, or is it is it? Yeah. I would say um, Asia, in in general, um, there's a very different relationship with government. Um, it's um, people comply a lot more, um, and it's saved them in some senses. Um, some of the best vaccinators are uh, also, there are those who are confident in the vaccination, but less, not always with the government, but they still go with it. But I, I have to say like Japan, well, not Japan, Japan has been an, a bit of a strange outlier in, in Asia, but like Singapore um, and China in general, I mean, it's, and frankly, authoritarian governments are doing much better with vaccination than the ones who have freedoms, as it were. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's interesting, really, just because what, is, what does that really tell you? You know, it's like, um, uh, you know, if, if people if people choose not to get vaccinated and then they I mean, certainly with COVID, it seems like life or death, you know, it's it, uh, you know, we work on a bit of, you know, these things of trying to get people to take the vaccination or, or treatments and things. And it's, it's, um, it's hard for me to understand um, uh, somebody's belief that their religion tells them that they shouldn't take the vaccine. Um, uh, I respect it, but I don't understand it. You know, like, it seems like, you know, there's a certain point where uh, I don't. I don't think it's written in any book anywhere where you shouldn't take the vaccine. So it's hard to understand that. That um, you know, it's hard for me to understand that to follow that when it's life or death. You know. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, I've really come to know, and this is also I learned this in my childhood. Um, 
the power of belief. It's, it's really deep. I mean, you see it now. It's the kind of things that people believe is, is intoxicating for some of them. I mean, some of the things we see, and it's nothing about education. I mean, we see some reasonably educated people who you would think should know better, but it's not about the, it's not about that. Um, yeah. it, it's really, I mean, the only way I think of it is, is, I mean, you don't need evidence to believe in God. I mean, it's, and that I think is something that helps me right. kind of, um, this isn't about the facts. And I think that's where, that's where we're stuck from a from the scientific community is it's really hard for scientists and, and even public health people, um, but particularly scientists to get their head around, you know, <laughs> um, the kinds of beliefs that, that people have. Um, and it's deep. So, you know, when you do, so from little I understand about the methodology, you'll do questionnaires around the world, right? And then you'll also do one-on-one -on -one interviews where you, where you just sit with a person and talk to them. Is that how you, you, yeah, you sort of it, build a profile? Well, we, um, because we're dealing with um, the global picture, it's not individual profiles per se. It's really uh, more... Um, we're looking at dynamics. We're looking at how groups are. And, and I think that we kind of missed the boat in terms of individual behavior. Nobody, nobody wanted to believe this. I had doors closed in my face 15 years ago for not being positive enough and just kind of focus on the good stuff, just push them out there, you know? And, and I said, you know, we're going to get in trouble here because this is not going away. Um, and, and it hasn't, and I, to be honest, when I saw it getting bigger and I, I really saw that it was going to get bigger, I never, um, I, I didn't ima imagine that it could have gotten this much bigger. Um, but also when I started seeing it was before social media, you know, Facebook didn't open until 2006. Um, you know, Google was like the one thing that was new on the landscape from 98. Um, and we forget that's pretty recent history, but the amplification that happened with that has been, and also we're seeing, we're look, doing a lot of really, I mean, I'm a, a rare anthropologist that spends a lot of my time with big data. I have, you know, really huge data sets from our, social media monitoring, we, we look across a hundred different languages and we do a lot of analytics looking at, it's a kind of crowd behavior, um, but also we see language diasporas. Um, uh, France is the most skeptical country in the world. We've done so many different types of surveys comparing to other countries and even others now are, are seeing, I mean, we kind of called that out in 2015 and I think more and more people have recognized this. But the concerning thing is that in our global trend analysis between 2015 and 2019, we've seen that uh, North, North and West Africa, kind of Francophone Africa, is now turning much more skeptical. Other places have gotten a bit more confident and we're seeing the Francophone diaspora, as it were, um, and we see, we've seen that with different languages, very strong anti-vaccine movement in Poland. Um, um, Andrew Wakefield was on the town hall, town steps um, there. We had, and also was speaking to an audience of, I think it was around 20,000 in a naturopathy conference in Warsaw. Um, and anyway, they have a highly organized anti-vaccine movement. And we're seeing uh, in the Polish communities in Scotland and England, um, now they were really good vaccinators and there's a lot of hesitancy. So people, the Somali migrant community, their anxiety about autism, it's in Sweden, it's in the UK, it's in Minnesota. And so, yeah. So how do you, I mean, you're talking about, yeah, really into also a lot of, as you said earlier, intelligent, you know, discourse or seemingly intelligent discourse around the anti-vaccine, right? And then, 
and so these sort of links to autism, links to these other problems, how does one go about combating that? Because that's powerful and you know, there are large groups of people that get are getting funding around that now. And so it's, if they're saying it's science, whether they're, it's true, like how do we get into the, into the real nuts and bolts of how we're gonna combat these maybe miscalculations or misinformation when they're coming from very well-spoken people? How do we work on that? Well, I mean, one of the things we try to do is kind of map the influencers and look at who are the, the bigger kind of, who are the trusted figures and not trusted in terms of, um, and this is where you have to get your head around this in a way, trusted doesn't mean credible. Trusted means who people turn to, even if it's someone that you is totally anti-science, but those are the, those are the audiences that we need to to shift. So, I mean, if you think of it, we're looking at more and more, almost in a political sense, you look at your base, look at your swing vote and your opposition. And we're trying to kind of work with that swing vote because some of the big data analytics, and I'm working more with engineers and physicists actually, um, because then the amount of data is so big now, and we're seeing the kind of behavior where the anti-vaccine groups, and this is through online analysis, are recruiting these swing votes 500% times faster than the pro, which is very kind of comfort zone speaking to each other, right. kind of central, even though the numbers are much bigger in the pro side. So how do you do it? Well, we're, we're actually right now working with about 16 countries in Central uh, Asia and Eastern Europe uh, in a big initiative with UNICEF, doing a lot of social media analytics, but then using that, and we're very much, um, our mantra is, you know, don't design strategies without, you know, listening. I mean, don't, don't sit in a boardroom and decide what's good for people. That's out. Uh, that never actually, there was maybe a hope for something like that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but we do not have the same publics now. And we, if we don't kind of engage them, and so we're using that um, information we're finding, sitting down with the ministries of health, with the local communities um, to design uh, engagement strategies and we're doing it initially through social media, but then, you know, those same th threads and, and themes that they want to build on, then, you know, you take it out offline and the, you keep it, some of it in social media networks. But then, I mean, I've just been doing a 15 country project with Africa CDC. And, you know, a lot of what we're hearing from where the their influences come from are radio, TV, I mean, they still watch TV and, and it has maybe two channels, you know, it's depending on where you, where you live. So you can actually reach people. Um, um, so we, I think we do need to be care. I, I think right now there's too much focus just on social media because I think we should remind ourselves that people still talk to each other and then a lot of parts of the world still rely on a lot of very basic traditional media. You know, um, fighting the battle on radio is completely different than doing it in social media. Do you have to have a different kind of listening ability with radio because the, you know, yeah. how do you, you know, is each country its own battle, essentially language, you know, uh, values, religion, you know, uh, socioeconomic, are they each one a different battle around the world? Yeah, and I would say even within countries, you know, how you deal with Kano State in northern Nigeria and how you deal with Lagos are going to be a whole different um, kettle of fish. I'll never forget being up in Kano State and they said, you know, Dr. Heidi, these, these people don't understand us. These polio people, they sent rotary up here. We don't have businesses here. That's Legos. Rotaries for those business people, those rich business people, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Rotary was trying to do good things and, you know, thought of themselves as being pretty benign in a sense. Um, 
and it was really interesting. It was actually, I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective, but um, yeah, so even within countries, India, my goodness, <laughs> it's like, you know, a region. Yeah, it's, it's, it's vast, like the United States is vast too. And I yeah. mean, I'd imagine there's a lot of variant around the different countries or well, you know, different parts of England, you know, uh, just to try and get them to take it. I mean, you know, what does it mean if they, they aren't going to take the vaccine? What does it mean for our world? Oh, well, I, I think it's going to be a really, well, I think the polio story in Northern Nigeria, which is really was the tipping point that made me leave UNICEF and set up the confidence project. When I saw that just, just a rumor got so out of control and had no adverse event, there was no problem with the vaccine, it was totally politically driven, and it led to Nigerian virus reinfecting over 20 countries around the world, costing the global program $500 million. That's what can happen when people don't vaccinate even in one small corner, not so small corner of Nigeria. You know, when you say it's politically driven, I mean, this is perplexing to me. What would be behind, what is really behind, you know, kind of bigger state anti-vaccination programs? What would, what would be the reason there? Well, in Kano State, um, it was very much, um, I mean, the, the, when the governor called the statewide boycott from 2003 to 2004, um, and there wasn't really an end date when he called it, which was part of our challenge at the time, um, uh, it was on the heels of 9-11. Of and they uh, had zero trust. They were absolutely sure that the war was at West, uh, the West was at war with Muslims, which indeed most of the rhetoric implied that. Um, and so they didn't trust big boxes coming from USAID. And they, I, I'll never forget one, one father, there was a couple of fathers, they say, you think we're stupid? You know, I mean, uh, I was had a house at translator with me. It says, we see the box says sterile. Of course, you know, you think we don't understand, you know. Yes. And, right. and uh, I had never, you know, you don't make these, you, you go through your routine and you don't think of the implications of some of these things. But the other, it was in the case of Kano, it was like a, it was multiple levels of politics. The, the Northern, you know, Muslim poorer North had lost the presidential candidate to the wealthier Christian South to, in very crude terms. Um, um, I mean, basic terms, but so there was already, uh, there was an internal resent. We don't wanna make the central government look good. You know, they want us to take um, these polio vaccines so they can go and show up in Geneva and say, look, look what I did. We don't want to make him look good. And there was that going on. There was also the, you know, we don't trust these foreign powers. Uh, they can't be doing some, this out of, you know, it was a real questioning of motives. Um, and then the other thing is in the background, there were court cases against Pfizer uh, because some children had died in a meningitis trial. It turned out that it was unrelated to the meningitis drug, but they did lose the case on the basis of um, ethical processes that there was not enough. But anyway, that was in the background. So there was a context of distrust. There was the politics with central government, the politics with the West. And some people were just generally, uh, and, th and then they were also like, you don't give us what we feel. Our kids are dying of measles and you keep coming to our door with polio. What's that about? Yeah. You know, um, it, this misinformation theme that just, it starts small and starts to spread as its own, its own, its own infection in a, in a sense, as it starts to infect people's minds. Well, it's, I, I, in my book, I have this chapter on emotional contagion and it's really, it is contagious. Um, and even after a year, for instance, I mean, 
uh, there was a boycott from 2003 to 2004, as I mentioned, even when they managed to change uh, their mind for a, a number of reasons. I mean, one of them was that from the UNICEF side, we procured the, the polio vaccines from Ind Indonesia and made a point of that because that was another Muslim country. Um, but there were a number of different negotiations happening with the Organization of Islamic Countries globally between, you know, um, a higher scholar in Cairo and, and Geneva, and there were all kinds of negotiations in different ways um, that finally shifted the tide. And then the governor, you know, took a polio vaccine publicly or, or his child gave one to a child. Um, but that didn't, I mean, when people are for a year, they're told to be scared. They're not gonna say, oh, oh, it's okay now, you know? It took, it's take, it took a long time to get people back on, on deck with, with that. Um, and it wasn't really the parents um, that initially, they, they, you know, a lot of them were initially quite happy to be back, have vaccin kids vaccinated, but then they got scared. You know, do you think that if we could produce them more globally, you know, we're right now we're hearing that I think most of them are, are made in the West. I mean, there is the, I guess the Chinese vaccine and the Indian, but if, if they were produced throughout the world and we could get manufacturing really up and running homegrown, if you will, do you think that is part of it when, you know, it's really struck me when you say it's true, the boxes are coming in from the United States. I'm not going to trust that. Is there any kind of um, analysis or research into if that might help? If it's home, sort of homemade. Um, yeah. It depends how much you trust your government, <laughs> um, and because one of the things in in some of our global COVID surveys, we did ask the question, um, how much? I mean, would or how much would the country of manufacture of the vaccine affect your decision? Sixty five percent. And this was like 17, 18,000 people around the world. And 65% uh, of them said it would, it would certainly affect their decision. Now, we didn't, I mean, we sh didn't have enough bandwidth in this big global study to start getting into details and say, well, which countries, you know, but in, but in general, in some parts of the world, um, like in Eastern Europe, they would much rather have a vaccine from Brussels than they would from Ukraine, even if you're sitting in Ukraine. Um, so it kind of depends on where you sit in the world, but the principle of a local vaccine for some of them, a lot of them definitely want at least it to be tested locally, if not produced locally. Um, yeah. Do we need a... Um... You know, we talked a bit about the anti-vaxxer movement, but do we need a pro-vaccine movement? You know, like, you know, I know that um, seeing people in your community take the vaccine is incredibly important. If you took those social media influencers and you just had them literally just with their own camera shoot them taking the vaccine, you know, at a hospital or wherever, it, it, do, should that be systematic as opposed to the way we do it now where it's like, oh wait, there's anti-vaxxers, we need to come up with a strategy? Well, I think that there has been in the last, um, uh, there has been a growing amount of recognition that we have a problem. Um, and there have been more and more efforts to try to get, um, uh, try to build confidence, but it's been way too slow. And it's been still kind of still, I think, too strongly driven by um, the goal of getting somebody vaccinated. I mean, and not trying to understand <laughs> people's situation. Um, it's let's dress it up so it's more acceptable to be persuaded rather than really cleaning the slate and going into a community and saying, you know, there's, there's this vaccine, co-create with us, you know, finding out who does want it, who does believe in it, and, um, you know, starting to work with them. I think we need, I, I find that the public health community is, doesn't want to let go of the shore, as they say, 
they haven't, especially with the social media space, it's been, um, a lot of them haven't gotten much farther than like SMS appointment reminders. Uh, and and I, I actually understand a lot of it because the whole social media space is, is messy. It's emotional. It's not fact. Um, but that's where the people are living. And that's where young mothers and the ones that we, you know, even, even some of the, I mean, I've been hearing some of the testimonies from some even 80-year-olds who see one, and partly because they're not so exposed, seeing one scary thing and say, no way am I gonna take that COVID vaccine. So I think we need to be there and, and we're not there in a way and it's not easy. And I think one of the challenges right now is that we're in a digital revolution. We're in a, trans, a technology transformation. And I think um, not that we should sit back and wait for this to happen, but I do think this emerging generation of doctors and what will be public health authorities will be much more digitally comfortable um, uh, and being able to engage, listen to, and be alert to some of what's going on in spaces that I think a lot of public health community, I mean, have, have no clue. Um, they, you know, think that, I mean, I hear some of the things that I'm told that, you know, just carry on that's fringe and not seeing what's the tidal wave that's um and i think covid is an absolutely absolutely huge opportunity to change the dynamic around vaccines there is no point in the history of vaccines and i can't imagine it's going to be at least a century maybe maybe not but i hope not i hope not less uh when the world, uh, we have an opportunity to show the value of a vaccine in more tangible ways than we've ever had that opportunity. It is touching every sphere of life now, everywhere on the planet. If we don't embrace this and use this opportunity to rebuild a relationship with the public, and cap we don't, I mean, we've had economists sitting in their offices in Harvard and wherever writing economic al analysis of the cost effectiveness of vaccine, but that has zero impact on the guy in the street. Today, you tell him if you get a vaccine, you can get your job back. That's a whole different compelling story. And, and you know, get a vaccine, you can go back to school. Um, I mean, you're, there was, that's a bit different because we have school mandates, so that's a, but that's not true in most parts of the world that way. So, but you know what I mean. There's there's a whole, you know, get a vaccine, you can finally hug your grandmother or something like that. I mean, it's we need to use this opportunity um, in, in tangible ways and come out of it with people having a, I think, having a, a different appreciation of it because they've been there, they mm -hmm. see it. Yeah, I mean, it's terrifying here to see that there was a very prominent person who was espousing anti-vaccines in the United States who was taken off of uh, Instagram. And um, the, the, the power that that had, very notable person, you know, it, it's actually the, it, the movement around him has grown. So it, it's kind of what you're saying. Instead of having a conversation around, let's have a conversation. Why are people having these feelings? What's behind all this? You know, where did this come from? And, and have, really having a conversation, there is now this sort of cutting people off is swelling, I think, some of the anti-vaccine movement, at least what I'm sort of following in the United States. Yes. And, yeah. And so how do we protect against that? that that's more even almost more dangerous in a way that you know, cutting someone off as opposed to having discourse, like, a, like you said, the public square using digital space as a public conversation um, yeah. and have a healthy conversation with scientists, with religious scholars, with people. I mean, we need to have that town hall, really, don't you think? Exactly. To have a, a, a yeah. yeah. And I think some of that is happening, starting to happen just because we're seeing the gravity of the inequity between the you know, uh, who's getting vaccinated and who isn't. Um, there's been a, a fantastic movement with the, um, I know in, in the US, um, 
uh, the Black Coalition um, Against a COVID uh, in the DC area. And they've, I mean, this Black doctors, Black uh, in town halls and community areas here, they've started to do that with some imams and in some areas, but they have been waiting too long. I mean, the, the GPs here, I, I've been hearing, they say, you know, we're all advertising that we did 15 million vaccinations, but, um, you know, what percent of that is, is white? And what they said is that, um, this is the GP association, that two to three percent of the people who didn't want the vaccine when they got the call were white. 20 to 30 percent didn't want to take it were in the Black, Asian, and minority communities. There was also a discrepancy between the wealthier and the poorer whites, because the poorer whites were much less, um, more likely to say no thank you. So that's um, deep. Are you optimistic that we'll solve these problems? Is COVID our great first test? And, and have we failed it? Have we, are there reasons for optimism? You know, as, even though we all got off to a slow start? I think we have a, we have an opportunity. We're in kindergarten with COVID and vaccines right now. We're at the really very beginning. The year ahead is our opportunity. And um, I think we, um, uh, we're gonna be seeing more and more vaccines. And we're gonna, st as we start moving into the lower age groups is the area where we're gonna be seeing the, um, you know, more challenges, I think. With the lower age groups. Yeah, cause they just don't wanna take it. They don't think they need it. Yeah. And also, I mean, we have to let you go, but before we go, you know, I was just reading that the, um, Ebola seems to be surfacing again. And so if we have this problem of people afraid to take a vaccine, you know, the implications with something like Ebola, what are you concerned about that? Or is your group concerned about something like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, this is the, the cases in Guinea. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a challenge. Um, and I know that we've been working on, we uh, did a lot of community building, trust, trust, rumor management and trust building in five African countries around Ebola these past um, five years. And we've just been working on to roll out some of these Ebola vaccines with healthcare professionals and DRC. Um, and it's been interesting because in the context of COVID, you know, the Ebola vaccine, there's concerns that um, people won't want the Ebola vaccine because they'll think it's COVID. They'd want it because it was an Ebola vaccine, but so we've got these complex situations. I don't think uh, Ebola will be jumping continents. I think it, it'll probably, for now anyway, um, stay in, but it's already spread, as you know, to West Africa and it's coming back. So it's just, I think what it reminds us is, you know, we're facing multiple challenges, you know, and, and refugees and situations, humanitarian settings. You can't tell people to distance when they're in refugee camps. I mean, you know, without allowing the, so we've got a lot of complex situations here. So I don't know, I can only hope that this kind of wakes us up to some new <laughs> new ways of, of being, but let's see how we do. But I do think this year is, is, if last year was the year of kind of getting it under control, this is the year of the vaccine. And, right. and yeah. You know, have you, uh, do you still get to take pictures? Whenever I can, I haven't done much of it this year. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you get to take walks and, and shoot or not at all? Yeah, I, I we are allowed some um, walks, um, I think once a day or there's, there's, it's a bit limited, but, oh, right. um, but I do, I have been trying to take pictures of things that are, you know, COVID markers, whether it's signs or people with masks mm. or uh, just so we don't forget, I mean, oh, I, yeah. remember I was based at UN headquarters at 9-11 and I spent 
couple of weeks going around and photographing because I thought, you know, we say we'll never forget. And then, but I'll never forget all the, all the posters on and that people had put all around New York. Have you seen, they look like wanted posters, but they were family members who had not been found in, in, um, um, in the zero, um, what's, you yeah, know what I'm Ground zero, I'm, yeah. Ground zero. Is, um, it, is it hard to go back and look at those photos now? Um, it was harder to take them um, I think it's not, it's not easy, but it does bring it all back. And it's, I mean, it's different now, but still, um, oh, my husband had extremely serious COVID was hospitalized on oxygen and, you know, for people who haven't been close to it, um, it's traumatic. I mean, also, I think one of the really hard things with, with COVID is, it's been this isolation. I mean, people dying alone, people yeah. dying. And, and I just, there must be a better way. Um, I mean, it, it's just Zoom funerals. I mean, uh, I mean, I understand it, but to a certain extent, but I think as that's been, I think we're gonna have some real long-term um, damage, I am mean, um, psychological, uh, yeah. it, we're not going to click back tomorrow when this is all over. It's going to take a while because people have been through trauma that they're kind of dealing with now, but um, it's going to take a while. You know, thank you so much for spending time with us. This was really incredible insight into the way people think. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, I hope it was, uh, <laughs> I'm, I've gotten more, I'm going to be listening to more of your podcasts. I've, um, it's, yeah, I'm. Thank you so much. Always yeah, like to thank you. Work. Take care of you. Okay. Good to see Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.